Uh, hi. Uh, so, of course, I can't see many of you, but you can feel free to just turn on the videos too if you want to. And please be, uh, I'd be happy to see more people's faces. Yes, thank you. Hi, Vanya. <laughs> so, great. So, hello, everyone. And it's really like quite happy and excited to see you all and like coming together in this workshop series. So welcome to the first session of the Respect and Shame in Healthcare and Biotechs workshop series. So it's jointly organized by myself. I am Supriya Subramani. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute of Biomedical Ethics and History of Medicine at University of Zurich. And Professor Luna Dolzol, Associate Professor in Philosophy and Medical Humanities. This workshop series is supported by Welcome Trust Shame and Medicine Project. In this workshop series, what we aim is to critically engage with both the conceptual and phenomenological understandings of respect and disrespect, shame and humiliation, and other related concepts. So, by bringing together scholars from different disciplines as well as different frameworks and approaches, we hope to enhance our understanding of both respect and shame for optimal delivery of healthcare, as well as bring rich insights to bioethics debates particularly. So um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. The first is the workshop will be recorded and a copy of it will be available afterwards on the Shame and Medicine Project website. The format for this session is first the speaker. The first speaker will be giving a presentation for 40 minutes and then it will be followed by 20 minutes of open discussion. There will be a short 10 minutes uh, break. And then the second speaker that is usually the early care scholar will have 40 minutes of a paper presentation. And then the feedback by the discussant that is here, Luna. And then there'll be open discussion with the audience. We are looking forward for much critical engagement with the paper and with, with both scholar, you know, the peers here. If you have any questions, uh, please use a chat box. You can either type the question, I will read it out aloud or Luna can do that. And we just are just type capital Q and I will call the person's name and you can unmute and raise a question yourself. And on the final note, uh, we are also happy that there will be a special section in the Journal for Evaluation of Clinical Practice, which is coming out of this workshop series. We are pretty happy with that. And we have opened the call for submissions. So if you're working around this concept, please do submit. So shortly to introduce Luna. Her research is primarily in the areas of applied phenomenology, philosophy of embodiment, philosophy of medicine, and medical humanities. Her current research is primarily focused on three interrelated themes, shame and self-conscious emotions, embodiment and self-other relations, and emerging medical and body-based technologies. She leads the Shame and Medicine Project funded by Wellcome Trust and the other project, the Scenes of Shame and Stigma and COVID-19 Project, which is funded by UKRI Arts and Humanities Research Council. She is author of The Body and Shame, Phenomenology, Feminism, and the uh, Socially Shaped Body, and co-editor of the books Body, Self, Other, The Phenomenology of Social Encounters, and The New Feminist Perspectives on Embodiment. Today, she will be discussing with us on trauma and shame, and the need for shame competence and shame-sensitive practice in health, social, and care services within public health. So yes, over to you, Lona. Thank you, Sufriya. Um, I'm just going to share my screen um, because I have a slideshow. One second. Um, great. So really happy to be presenting as part of this um, the seminar series. And to just give some background to this paper, um, I work in Exeter in the University of Exeter, which is a city in Devon, quite near another city called Plymouth. Um, many of you might have heard of Plymouth. And in Plymouth, there's a network of practitioners that's called the Trauma-Informed um, Plymouth Network. And it's a network of practitioners such as social workers, psychologists, dentists, doctors, police um, officers, who are very passionate about what's called the trauma-informed approach and, um, and are sort of working together to make Plymouth a trauma-informed city. And um, I've was introduced to the Plymouth Trauma Network um, last year because they be, they're really interested in a paper I had co-written with Barry Lyons um, about um, health-related shame. And that kind of led me down a, a path of investigating and researching the links between trauma and shame and kind of contextualizing it in the, con uh, in the current research project that I'm doing um, called Shame and Medicine, where the aim of that research project is to develop principles for shame-sensitive practice for healthcare. 
And um, this paper kind of came out of that work and a question that one of the practitioners asked me, which was, what's the difference between trauma-informed approaches and shame-sensitive practice? Um, and, and that kind of led me down a research path, um, and this is the product. So I'm really interested um, to hear people's feedbacks and ideas and thoughts after I present. So um, experiences of, I'm just min, sorry, minimize the, there we go. So experiences of trauma are widespread and there exists a wealth of evidence directly correlating um, trauma to a range of poor social and health outcomes, which incur substantial costs to individuals and to society. So trauma has been um, hold on, positioned, sorry, as a, Significant public health issue, which, as um, Magruder et al. argue, necessitates what they call a, a trauma-informed approach to public health policy agendas. So shame is a, a key emotional um, after-effect of experiences of trauma, and then on emerging literature argues that we may have, um, and I quote, failed to see the obvious by neglecting to acknowledge the influence of shame on post-trauma disorders. So in this talk, I argue that effectively addressing post-traumatic states necessitates a clear understanding of shame, and in particular, what I call chronic shame and its phenomenology and effects. Failure to identify and address shame in post-traumatic states and within trauma-informed approaches can be detrimental, potentially compounding trauma, disrupting treatment, and leading to the ineffectiveness of interventions that are designed um, to help people. Offering strategies for shame sensitive practice, I suggest the need for shame competence in health, social and care services and within public health. Okay, so let's see, moving on um, the slide. So this, you may or may not be familiar with the trauma, trauma informed approach. So I'll just give some background. The term trauma informed um, was introduced by Harris and Fallot in 2001 as a means to interrogate, uh, sorry, to integrate an understanding of trauma and its after effects into mental health services following the evidence that a significant number of individuals accessing mental health services were, were survivors of physical and sexual abuse. Since their early conceptualization of the trauma-informed approach, an expanding body of conceptual, empirical, and public health research correlating trauma with a range of um, social, psychiatric, psychological, behavioral, and physical problems has led to the redesigning and reconceptualizing of some health and social services using what's called the trauma-informed paradigm as a way to structure the way care is delivered. Um, oops. So, oh, sorry, I should be. Adopting a trauma-informed approach attempts to embed an understanding of how experiences of trauma can become central to an individual's life course and life outcomes, having profound negative effect on social outcomes, emotional well-being, mental and physical health, along with health um, relevant behavior. Research demonstrates that individuals who have experienced trauma can have adverse outcomes in all areas of life and these, that these effects can endure across a lifetime. These individuals are significantly more likely to suffer from chronic health issues, mental health problems, and substance use problems, as well as being correlated with outcomes such as homelessness, violence, marital problems, and incarceration, among others. In health and social care contexts, applying a trauma lens, as it's called, can powerfully elucidate the root causes of ill health, health-related behaviors, and social difficulties, leading to more effective interventions, support, diagnosis, and treatments. Um, Trauma-informed approaches involve a paradigm shift in how services and professionals respond to patients and clients, attempting to address root causes rather, rather than surface symptoms. So reframe, reframing the core diagnostic um, question. Um, oh, these slides aren't going. Um, I'm sorry. Um, the core diagnostic question from inquiring what is wrong with you to understanding rather what happened to you. Um, central to the trauma-informed approach is an understanding that typical emotional, psychological, and social aftereffects of trauma, which directly impede an individual's ability to seek out and engage, um, or directly in, um, impede an individual's ability to seek out and engage with health and social, social services that are designed to help them. And in addition, when trauma survivors do manage to engage with services that may help them, the interactions that they have with organizations, staff, um, and care providers who do not recognize and understand their trauma and its after effects may inadvertently lead um, to further disengagement and entrenchment of the problems that these services are designed to help. 
um, and treat. So in light of substantial um, research regarding trauma and its after effects, the trauma informed approach acknowledges the particular vulnerabilities and triggers that traditional service delivery approaches may exacerbate for trauma survivors, redesigning services to be more sensitive and supportive with the aim of avoiding re-traumatization re and any additional harm. So shame has recently been introduced um, or included in the diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder in the DSM-5 under the umbrella of um, persistent negative emotional states. So shame has recently come to be identified in the trauma literature as part of a constellation of negative emotions, along with um, the common ones that are cited, fear, horror, anger, and guilt, um, that are common for trauma survivors in the post-traumatic state. So understanding shame and its role in the post-traumatic state is, I argue, central to the, to the success of the trauma-informed approach. So the, the term shame, um, as I'm using it here, should be understood or considered an umbrella term that refer, refers to a whole range of experiences, including cognate emotions such as embarrassment, um, chagrin, mortification, and humiliation. Um, as James Gilligan, I think, usefully notes, um, and I like this analogy, he says, in the same way that we use the term flower as a generic term to refer to a wide variety of different but related plants, then the term shame encompasses a wide range of experiences, including experiences like feelings of being slighted, insulted, disrespected, dishonored, disgraced, demeaned, um, treated with contempt, ridiculed, mocked, rejected, feelings of inferiority, inadequacy, of being a failure, losing face, and being treated as if one is insignificant, unimportant, or worthless. Shame is commonly characterized as a negative self-conscious emotion, and it's an experience that arises when we are concerned about how we are seen and judged by others. So we feel shame when we are seen by another or others, and whether those others um, are present, imagined, or simply a viewpoint that has been internalized. When we are seen to be flawed in a crucial way, or when some part of our core self is perceived to be inadequate, inappropriate, um, or immoral. And during a shame experience, we can feel deeply and, in, and often irreparably flawed, unworthy and unlovable, and that our social position and our social bonds are under threat. Um, shame is um, described as alienating, isolating, and deeply disturbing. And it can provoke powerful feelings of inferiority and powerlessness, self-contempt, effectiveness, to name a few. In addition, shame itself as an experience is shameful and taboo. And for these reasons, shame is usually avoided, shunned, or kept secret at all costs, both individually, societally, and collectively. Um, so while it is um, commonly characterized as a negative experience for an individual, at the same time, shame is a necessary part of human life, um, a sort of inevitable part of human life. Um, and healthy shame, um, as it's often called in the psychological and psychotherapeutic literature, can lead to the expression of positive attributes such as modesty, humility, gratitude, along with respect for oneself and others. It can also be a powerful motivating force for personal growth and change and in forging harmonious and meaningful relations with others. However, healthy shame is very easily distorted and can become unhealthy, maladaptive, or destructive, or toxic shame. Um, it's also called pathological shame. And this, this type of shame is corrosive and pernicious um, and can lead to a pervasive and enduring sense of inferiority, inadequacy, defectiveness, along with a sense of not being worthy of respect, love, or connection. It is an experience that can organize oneself, life, and world, and have deep significance and impact on an individual and their life chances. So toxic or pathological shame usually occurs um, in what's called a chronic form. So um, the theologian Stephen Patterson writes at length about this experience of chronic shame. And he writes, there is an enormous difference between acute reactive shame and the chronic shame that shapes a whole personality and may last a lifetime. When individuals appear to experience the whole of life is actually or potentially shame productive and manifest such symptoms as withdrawal, self-contempt, inferiority, and gaze aversion as a matter of course throughout their everyday lives, shame has become pathological and chronic. Chronic shame is frequently characterized firstly by the nagging and persistent um, possibility of shame, and secondly, by persistent sense of inadequacy, defilement, failure, and lesser self-worth. Chronic shame, sometimes characterized by what um, the shame theorist Leon 
worms, worms are termed a shame attitude, um, where one's entire personality and character is structured around shame and shame avoidance. Um, and it becomes a very elusive experience. So instead of, um, instead of shame, what comes to dominate experience um, is a pernicious form of shame um, or of anticipated shame or, or a persistent and heightened shame anxiety of which an individual may or may not be aware. So shame anxiety appears in experience as a corrosive undermining and persistent fear of, or anxiety about being objectified, judged, labeled or rejected by others. It is a persistent fear of disgrace and of being looked um, at, uh, at looked at by others with contempt. So it is important to know that shame anxiety um, may not be experienced as shame. So instead, it may be dominated by shame avoidance and as such characterized by emotions such as fear, anxiety, self-consciousness, stress, or powerful impulses to hide, avoid, or escape, along with negative feelings about the self characterized by a sense of inadequacy or deficiency in relation to others. Um, so it is, it is clear that a significant cause of persistent chronic shame, um, as I've discussed it here, is trauma. Um, and there's plenty of literature that discusses these connections, where childhood relational trauma and traumatic experiences in later life are, strong, are strongly correlated with experiences of chronic shame um, and shame anxiety. Um, so as noted above, um, shame is usually positioned in discussions regarding the after effects, after effects of trauma as one of many emotional responses that can occur in the wake of trauma, with fear usually identified as the dominant emotion. However, there's an increasing body of literature that positions shame as a keystone affect of trauma and the post-traumatic state. So traumatology research has seen the development of the idea that shame and trauma are inextricably linked, where some argue that the post-traumatic shame, that post-traumatic shame is a key experience that shames the post-traumatic state, while others have come to theorize and describe PTSD as a shame disorder. At present, there is a growing literature that explores the centrality of shame for individuals who have experienced trauma. And this body of research argues that shame is a world organizing affect for many survivors of trauma, um, and that shame is behind much of the maladaptive behavior associated with trauma, PTSD, and other post-traumatic states. Um, and the cause of um, shame in the post-traumatic state is complex, but there seem to be a multitude of overlapping factors which render shame a predominant, if not the dominant, um, emotional experience following trauma. So um, I'm citing a wide range of research here, but research demonstrates that shame can be brought on first like um, by the traumatic experience itself, can be brought on by incorrect or inaccurate feelings of blame or responsibility for what happened in a traumatic event. Um, it can be brought on by feelings of defilement and unlovability as a result of neglect or abuse, particularly in childhood. It can be brought up about by rumination about one's behaviors, actions, and reactions at the time of trauma. The sense of being damaged or defiled as a result of having experienced trauma or having a trauma diagnosis, such as PTSD, it can be brought out by the symptoms of PTSD or the symptoms of post-traumatic, non-pathological post-traumatic states, um, by the labels attached to one's identity as a result of trauma and post-trauma outcomes, labels like victim or survivor or addict or homeless, um, by the coping mechanisms one engages in to cope with trauma, by the fear of judgment of, by others if they discover one's trauma, by the social taboos associated with the trauma one has experienced, um, by revealing trauma in clinical and psychotherapeutic encounters, by falling short of one's own ideals and standards, and because of the taboo and shameful nature of shame itself. So for each of those things I mentioned, um, there's some literature that I'm citing. Um, so in, a, in addressing um, the impact um, of emotions for trauma survivors for the treatment of PTSD and within a trauma-informed approach, um, Taylor's question, um, and, which is, have we failed to see the obvious um, with respect to the influence of shame on post-trauma disorders, seems particularly pertinent. And understanding shame, and in particular chronic shame, as a keystone um, after effect or sequela of trauma experiences has the potential to elucidate the root cause of a range of maladaptive behaviors associated with trauma. However, as noted above, um, chronic shame 
is very difficult to identify and diagnose, diagnose, so to speak. Um, it is not, it is an elusive experience that is often disguised or camouflaged by other experiences and feelings. And the relational psychotherapist Patricia DeYoung notes that those who suffer from chronic shame um, may not daily or consciously expect to be annihilated by shame. However, the threat is always around somewhere just out of awareness and kept at bay. What individuals live with is not shame, but instead what it costs them from falling into shame. As a result, what characterizes the experience of chronic shame in post-trauma states is not, a, not enduring and repetitive experiences of shame, but rather an atmosphere of anticipated shame or what is often called shame anxiety that leads to compensatory behaviors and experiences. So in this way, um, in experiences of chronic shame, shame itself often becomes invisible and what dominates experiences, other behaviors or feelings which are used to help circumvent or avoid shame or to mask or cope with the pain of shame. Um, as a result, living with chronic shame can lead to a range of compensatory behaviors. And these are powerful, um, what are called defensive scripts sometimes, or strategies or rules or habits of interaction, which make it possible for an individual to avoid the social threat, pain and emotional anguish that might come with shame and its chronic anticipation. As Langsey notes, the post-traumatic state gives rise to shame and to defenses that keep shame um, arousing awareness from consciousness. And Wilson et al. Um, concur in their discussion of shame and trauma. The powerful emotions of post-traumatic shame are associated with a broad range of avoidance behaviors, things like isolation, detachment, withdrawal, hiding, non-appearance, self-imposed exile, cancellation of appointments, surrender of responsibilities, emotional constriction, psychic numbness, emotional flatness, and non-confrontation with others. These avoidance behaviors help an individual protect themselves through avoidance um, by placing shame outside of conscious awareness. So in this way, shame can, as Wilson at all note, um, operate unconsciously. Um, in trauma complexes and initiate self-destructive and self-defeating mod modalities of behavior. What becomes problematic in understanding and treating trauma and the post-traumatic state is that these avoidance behaviors for shame are, are, um, are easily misread, as one theorist puts it, um, and shame becomes invisibilized and consequently becomes unacknowledged in efforts to provide care, treatment, and support. So, um, it has been acknowledged um, that shame is a potent treat treatment barrier for trauma survivors, leading to outright avoidance and to dropping out in attrition once engaged with care and social services. Um, indeed, there is ample evidence that the necessity to avoid shame or shameful exposure can interfere with individuals accessing healthcare and also prevent individuals from reporting traumatic incidents such as abuse, sexual assault, and violence. In addition, shame prevents the reporting of shame itself. Um, as individuals in clinical settings are sometimes reluctant to disclose feelings of shame out of fear of being exposed and rejected. So in these complex and overlapping ways, shame experiences lead to concealment and avoid avoidance consistent with the hallmark symptoms of PTSD and post-traumatic states. So in, in, um, in the context of seeking help through healthcare and social services, individuals who are chronically anxious about shameful exposure may avoid seeking help in the first place, may regularly miss appointments, may avoid disclosing honest details about traumatic events, lifestyle circumstances, may fail to follow through with treatments, may conceal diagnoses and coping behaviors from friends, families, and professionals. In fact, not only is shame a barrier to accessing um, services, it is very easily exacerbated and incited in the context of seeking help from professionals. Um, interactions with care professionals can compound feelings of shame as these interactions often involve unequal power relations, a fear of being judged, the scrutiny and exposure of one's potentially um, shameful past circumstances, coping behaviors, body illnesses, mental health status, along with other vulnerabilities. It seems clear that being attuned to the experiences of shame and chronic shame, along with the common scripts or strategies deployed to avoid shame and shameful exposure, um, become central to achieving trauma-informed practice, and in fact, central to facilitating individuals to seek help and engage with healthcare and social services. Um, 
So while shame is acknowledged fleetingly in some of the gray literature that addresses how to implement trauma-informed approaches, for the most part, any articulation of shame and its effects in post-traumatic states remains um, conspicuously absent from the literature and research regarding trauma-informed care. As has been discussed, shame is a powerful driver of behavior in post-traumatic states and can deeply affect if and how individuals engage with services and care providers. Having the capacity on the levels of policy organizations and individual practitioners to address shame directly is imperative, considering how impactful shame can be for those who have experienced trauma and post-traumatic states. Being attentive to shame and acknowledging its significance for individuals in care contexts can improve both engagement and outcomes. So, so I argue um, that using a shame lens inside, alongside a trauma lens is necessary for trauma-informed approaches to achieve the goal of redesigning services to be more sensitive and supportive with the ultimate aim of avoiding re-traumatization and any additional harm. As a result, trauma-informed approaches must um, and should begin to integrate shame-sensitive practice. So um, drawing what is shame-sensitive practice is a question. So drawing from the pioneering work of Matthew Gibson, shame-sensitive practice involves not only attempts at minimizing um, unhealthy shame, thereby reducing the potentially damaging and debilitating effects of shame, but also an awareness of shame dynamics where practitioners are more attuned to bypass deflected or invisibilized shame and its consequences, while also being alert to the ways that shame and shaming may, produced, may be produced through organizational practices and policies. In this way, shame sensitive practice is integrated at the interpersonal level. Um, so in interactions between practitioner colleagues and practitioners and their clients, and also at organizational and policy levels with an understanding of how institutional structures, practices and policy decisions can ex exacerbate or create conditions for shaming and, sh and shame. Um, and obviously related to that would be conditions for stigma and stigmatizing. Um, there are obvious overlaps and synergies with, with the main principles which guide trauma-informed approaches. However, focusing through a shame lens will reveal significant affective dynamics that are otherwise occluded. While there are a variety of ways to implement shame sensitivity in practice, and these should be tailored to the specificity of the service provision in question, whether it is healthcare, social work, policing, counseling, et cetera. This paper develops um, Gibson's work on developing shame sensitivity in, within social work to outline core principles, which guides shame sensitive practice more generally. So I'll finish with these principles for shame sensitive practice. Um, so firstly, for practitioners um, and within organizations. So, so creating individual shame competence, um, practitioners must have a theoretical and practical understanding of shame before they can identify um, it and start to develop competence working with it. Practitioners must understand what shame is, be aware of and able to identify behaviors that are used to cope with shame. Practitioners must also be aware of shame dynamics, how it circulates interpersonally and develop ongoing competence in identifying their own shame and its effects in their thinking, actions and behavior within professional practice. Um, creating organizational shame competence, individual shame competence must be developed within a framework of organizational shame competence. And this would involve the fostering of emotional intelligence within professional practice. We're speaking about and understanding emotions and their effects within professional practice becomes commonplace. In particular, the taboo regarding shame and shameful or stigmatized states and experiences must be directly addressed. Organizations must create and systematize nuanced and collaborative understandings of how shame is produced and experienced as a result of their policies and practices, avoiding attributing blame and shame to individuals where there is a disconnect between policy and operational capacity, especially in cases of chronic underfunding. Sorry, I just lost my paper here. One second. Um, next one. Um, sorry, collective accountability for shame sensitivity or shame reducing practice begins with mutually agreed goals and frames of reference. So this might take the form of an institutional code of conduct or a shame proofing toolkit. Cultures and practices of shaming and blaming must be avoided within organizations. Cultures of openness, learning and emotional intelligence should be fostered. 
avoiding shaming in policy and practice. So rejecting the use of shame or shaming as a behavioral tool of any kind in policy making and practice. So not all shame um, and shaming is accidental. And many initiatives rely on shame responses as the affective driver of the change that they hope to promote. For example, shame is frequently used in, in public health campaigns, um, for example, to combat, combat obesity or to improve hygiene. Um, organizations must be alert to how shaming may become implicit within policies and practice, for the instance, through the use of stigmatizing language or through creating dynamics of blame and individual responsibility for circumstances or conditions that may result from structural conditions or that may stem from a post-trauma coping behavior. Um, there must be continuous assessment of practice, so organizations and practitioners must frequently con um, conduct reviews and audits on work, um, which has the potential to generate, spread, or exacerbate shame, shaming, or stigma. So this involves vulnerability and requires critical reflection on past and future practice. There must be a willingness to admit mistakes, openness to critical reflection, and flexibility to make responsive changes in policy and practice. And then lastly for this section, um, organizations should create a, a culture of engaged practice in order to address social harms and stigma. So the systemic forces which shape and define what is stigmatized or considered shameful are not unchangeable. And in addition, many causes of trauma, um, like social deprivation, domestic abuse, et cetera, have their roots in societal and structural conditions, which can be changed and improved. Practitioners, along with leaders and managers within organizations, must be given the resources and encouraged to be engaged in making meaningful changes. This may happen through creating cultures of engaged practice and political activity, where individuals are encouraged um, to be in politically engaged, writing to their counselors or MPs, carrying out research, engaging with academic partners, becoming involved in local and national um, campaigns, engaging with media, with the overall aim of advocating and agitating for more humane and shame sensitive changes in law policy and practice. So those are some of the principles we've developed for practitioners and within organizations. Um, and also there's a set of principles for shame sensitive practice when engaging with individuals. So practitioners sort of on the front line working with clients. Um, so having shame competence um, to recognize shame and shame dynamics. So shame is frequently hidden and unacknowledged and it is notoriously di difficult to admit to um, because it is also taboo and shameful individuals go to great lengths to hide shame and what they consider to be shameful. So practitioners must become adept at using um, a shame lens alongside a trauma lens to identify shame through both physiological and psychological in indicators. They must become aware of common verbal, paralinguistic and nonverbal cues that might indicate a shame state um, and also become adept at recognizing bypass shame through the recognition and knowledge of common avoidance behaviors like aggression or violence, withdrawal, addiction, um, and so on. And practitioners must also become alert to shame dynamics within interpersonal encounters, recognizing that shame is a two-way street and relational and also often contagious. This means it can transfer from client, patient, or service user to the practitioner, infecting an entire um, interaction. Being able to recognize and manage these dynamics um, is important in order to minimize harm on both sides of the relationship. Um, practitioners should always avoid explicit shaming in the personal encounters with clients. Um, it should be an avoidance of shaming, judgment, or blaming of individuals for their circumstances or health. Um, but also, perhaps more complicated, is the avoidance of implicit shaming. Um, Practitioners must remain alert to the potential for implicit shaming in interactions, recognizing that relationships with care professionals inherently involve hierarchies and power dynamics and can inherently um, produce shame. Um, clients, patients, and service users are expected to expose their vulnerabilities in a context where there is usually an unequal power relation along with scrutiny and professional assessment. So practitioners must remain alert to and continually assess how the language they use, their demeanor, questioning style, emotional expression, and other interpersonal dynamics may inadvertently produce shame responses. In addition, consideration must be given to interpersonal dynamics based on gender, race, ethnicity, sp language, spoken, disability, age, etc. 
along with other factors in particular situations. So an, an example in my conversations with the Devon and Cornwall police or um, things like having a female police officer, maybe the most, let's say, shame appropriate practitioner to interact with a female victim of sexual assault. Practitioners should also avoid stereotyping, labeling and other stigmatizing ways of engaging with individuals. Um, addressing shame. So sometimes it is important to acknowledge shame in order to help normalize and alleviate it and acknowledging an unacknowledged and unspoken shame can give the toxic beliefs that are inherent in shame some legitimacy. So uncovering shame in a safe and sensitive way can help shift the burden of shame and also shift behaviors that may be in place to keep it at bay. However, this must be done with sensitivity. For some, even the word shame can be intensely triggering, um, such that it might be best approached indirectly through the use of other terms. Um, it is also important that distress is acknowledged without immediately closing down discussions to focus on prevention and solutions. And then two more, um, understanding particularities of shame for different groups. Um, so different groups and communities must be engaged with and collaborated with in order to understand particular sensitivities to shame, shaming and stigma, along with common behavioral responses to um, bypass shame. And this is the last one, creating um, sustainable connection and supportive networks. So, so shame is fundamentally a fear of rejection and a fear of losing meaningful connections to others. Um, so it is imperative that practitioners engage with practice that creates sustainable relationships alongside supportive networks, such that individuals feel they are understood, recognized and respected by the practitioners that are supporting them. Practitioners and services must be continually proactive in reaching out to individuals, especially when they disengage and continuity in relationships with individual practitioners and particularly particular services should be prioritized so meaningful relationships can be grounded in familiarity and trust. Structural factors such as the availability of appointment times, accessibility of clinical spaces, ease through which one can contact the service, length of waiting list, duration of service, continuity between services must be continually assessed to ensure that individuals feel supported and a sense of connection is maintained. Post-trauma states can last for years and even a lifetime, so there must be attentiveness to long-term support. Um, so in conclusion, so my last slide, addressing trauma means that shame most um, must not only be acknowledged, but it, it must also be addressed. And so offering strategies for shame sensitive practice, this talk has highlighted the need for shame competence in healthcare and um, health, social and care services and within public health, and argued for the integration of shame sensitive practice in the trauma informed approach. Thank you. Stop sharing. Thank you so much, Luna. Um, now we have, yes. So feel free to um, ask questions and yeah, or you can even type it in the chat box. Or you can just please unmute yourself and ask questions. Yes, yes, please, Dan. I think you're muted, Dan, I can't hear you. Yeah. Dan, we're still, yeah. Sure, please. Any other questions? Like Dan will take, yeah, take some time. Yes, please, Christine. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, hey, thanks, Christine. Luna, for the presentation. It was great. Um, I was wondering if, uh, in, in your research or in this specific line, uh, is a consideration of the fact that sometimes the, the clinical space is precisely a, a space in which you sh you. you you're not supposed to feel shame mm -hmm. and, and in, in which shame as, acts as some kind of barrier to, to what is clinically relevant or to, to knowing what is wrong with you in a way. Um, because in other spaces, I don't know, like in school or in your 
work. Uh, uh, shame is sometimes not an issue. I mean, you can you can you can be ashamed of things without without that being a problem in a way. But in the clinical setting, shame could act as a barrier or, or as an opacity. So it's, it's harder to know what's wrong if you're ashamed of things. I don't know if this is something that came up in your in your yeah. work. Yeah, definitely. That's come up in our research, looking at shame in medicine. There's very little empirical research looking at shame, how shame impacts clinical encounters. And also shame is like really difficult thing to um, research empirically because people often lie about it or don't disclose it or mm -hmm. don't even realize that it's part of what's gu guiding or driving their behavior. But there are a couple of papers that um, investigate shame in like clinical encounters between patients and physicians. And there's evidence that shame leads to those things that I mentioned, lying, like non-disclosure of health relevant things, not telling the truth about the circumstances of your health or your lifestyle, you know, lying about smoking or drinking. Um, it, well, shame might keep you from going to the doctor in the first place um, or going to a clinical because you are ashamed of your body ashamed of your condition ashamed that you were a smoker you know like ashamed of your lifestyle you think it's your own fault um there's evidence that it leads to people not disclosing their health status to family and friends not following through with treatment um and then it might be shame that's not related to your health or your body it might be like that you have low literacy there's a couple of papers that look at low literacy levels and how that the, the shame and stigma associated with that interf interferes with um healthcare as well so you don't want to admit to your doctor that you can't read the prescription they gave you or the pamphlet they gave you or you know um and because of the inherent power relation in clinical contexts whether it's with doctors or social workers or psychologists or police or whatever care social health service where you're in an encounter with an expert who's kind of there to judge you um, or assess you or, so they can help you there's this kind of um, I would argue inherent potential for shame as a result of that in, you know, shame in this really broadly understood sense where you understand it as like a fear of being judged by another. And that might lead to feeling of self-consciousness or feeling of low self-worth or might lead to what we kind of commonly think of shame um, or might lead to humiliation, you know, so like the way it lands on different people would maybe be experientially different, but there might be that common structure of the fear of the other looking at the self and judging them in some way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Christian. So we have a question from Kat. Um, Kat. Kat, do you want me to read out? I think so. So uh, can you, I mean, so Kat suggests, can you speak to chronic illness experienced as a trauma and shame, particularly thinking about young people with frequent clinical encounters? Um, I, I mean, I don't know if I would, I've not come across literature that talks about chronic illness as trauma, but I think that, there, that there's definitely potential to think about ongoing experiences of ill health as having, uh, causing trauma, um, depending yeah. on, um, but certainly like I just wrote a paper about um, chronic illness and shame anxiety. And especially when it's a stigmatized chronic illness like HIV or a hep C, um, a stigmatized but also invisible chronic illness. So you can conceal from others that you have that illness, maybe diabetes, hep C, HIV. Um, but you, what you live with is like the fear, this kind of constant fear that people will find out or can find out or might find out. And if they find out, they're going to think less of you somehow. And that this sort of shame, anxiety can be kind of a, a, an experiential component of living with chronic stigmatized invisible chronic illness um, so that's a kind of interesting thing to think about and I think one of the reasons I think moving away from trauma informed to shame sensitive might be useful for services is that trauma um, is a very specific experience right so it's you experience trauma it's a dis often considered like a an discrete episode like a, a an episode of violence or abuse, or it might be ongoing abuse um, or um, an accident or something that happens in a war wartime context. Um, but actually a lot of the traumas that people live with are like ongoing social harm. So things like poverty and social deprivation that aren't necessarily, maybe chronic illness could be considered in that vein of things that are like ongoing low burn kind of 
adversity that might last a lifetime, but you couldn't really point at it and say that's a trauma, like a discrete trauma event. And, um, and I think that shame sensitivity applies to everybody. We all experience shame and can be, it can drive our behavior in different ways. Um, and that focusing very exclusively on trauma and these trauma informed approaches might limit um, people, the, the, I don't know, the engagement with the idea. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Kat, if you have any follow-up to this, please do. Or next I'll go for Dan. Then now, Let's does it work? See if it's, is it uh, working yeah, now? Can you yeah, hear me? Can. Ah, amazing. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thanks so much for the talk, Luna. Thought it was really interesting. I missed the first uh, bit of it. So it's possible that my question slash comment is unfair, but I'm going to throw it at you anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so you said that shame is fundamentally a, a fear of being judged. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that the, the fear shame connection is a really old one. So it appears in Aristotle, for example, it seems to me really odd, right? Because I don't know what in shame could be fear, or what would justify reducing shame to fear because so from a f philosophy of emotion standpoint, it doesn't seem like shame has any of the same elements as fear, certainly. So it doesn't seem to involve a threat. It seems to involve or a threat evaluation, right? It seems to involve an evaluation that you have already been judged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess there's what a- people think of who I am, right? There's, yeah, sure. There's, I mean, the way I theorize shame is that it's a fear of losing social bonds. So it's, yeah, sure. There's the judgment of the other, but actually underneath that is that you don't want the judgment of the other because in judging you, they're going to ostracize, they may ostracize you, or reject you. So like the kind of underpinning the judgment, that kind of shame moment where you see yourself through the eyes of an other in a negative regard is why does, why does that lead to such a horrendously negative affect? Because we're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of being ostracized. We're afraid that that shame moment is the signal that you're going to be chucked out of the community. So I think that fear is like inherently there, but I think there's also a difference between um, shame and like a shame episode or acute shame and anticipated shame where or shame anxiety where what you're living with isn't shame like the flush of shame because someone's seen you do something wrong but what you're living with is like an anxiety that uh, that that shameful exposure is just around the corner so that is a kind of fear so like anxiety a fear of shameful exposure that shameful exposure may never happen you may never be judged nobody's judging you nobody's looking at you but you've internalized this idea that that's just around the corner Mm. Um, so yeah I kind of I think there's like a kind of like a deeper way to think about shame when you think about it I mean and it's a socio it's a sociological reading of shame like Thomas Jeff who's a kind of sociologist who theorizes shame in that way precisely in that way it's a fear of losing social bonds it's taken up by many other thinkers in social science and so sociology and psychology um, where the opposite of shame is not pride but is belonging right so not being thrown out of your social group mm. is that mm. maybe I'm, I'm not completely convinced but but <laughs> i i appreciate the uh, the um thanks your answer <laughs> thanks uh, for that question dan. so next Thank we you. have uh, sorry dan um uh, do you have any other follow-up questions no no thank you okay so the next we have is sean and then followed by kathleen Hey, thank you very much for the for the talk. This was this was great. Uh, just one quick question. I'm just curious about. Uh, do you have any thoughts or um, criticisms about um, the, the the question of like is there a phenomenon also of healthy shame mm -hmm. um, in contrast because you're focusing on toxic or a healthy maladaptive shame like and yeah. if there's healthy healthy shame or even some healthy uh, shame anxiety then like is that something um maybe play a role in clinical encounters or the ethical context as well and, and what should a shame sensitive policy or the uh, ethics should be looking like um, if you also include those parts of the emotions yeah sure um there's definitely healthy shame and um and shame can sometimes like for some people lead to positive like so in this in that paper i was talking about where it discussed the negative effects shame has in clinical 
encounters, like people lie or they avoid treatment or they don't disclose all the relevant information. A small percentage of people also said actually being shamed um, or feeling shame in a clinical encounter um, led me to improve my behavior, led me to quit smoking, led me to, you know. Um, so there's, it's un, like, it's definitely the case that for some people in some contexts, shame can have a, a pro-social function, it's called. So it kind of brings you back into the fold and it makes you change your behavior. So you're kind of doing what's expected by the external norms, right? However, it's impossible to know when shame is going to have is going to land in that way on someone right so you have no idea if someone's living um in a post-trauma state or someone is from a marginalized or disadvantaged uh, community or group and chronic shame is a kind of feature of their day-to-day -day life they already feel disadvantaged and discriminated against and marginalized um, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that any shaming or shame experience in that kind of context will just cause further harm and because you can never tell who shame is going to harm you don't you can't look at someone and know if they've experienced trauma um as you might be able to identify other marginalized states um as, because you can never tell how shame is going to land on an individual um i think the blanket policy to is to just never use it um and and there's lots of evidence in public health that shame and stigma are just not effective in public health campaigns you know like one in 10 people might like be motivated to lose weight after an anti-obesity campaign that fat shames people but most people won't it might just further entrench the behavior that is problematic or you know lead to avoidance um, and lead to like worse senses of self-esteem and so on so that that was kind of the answer it's like because you because shame is volatile and unpredictable it's just better to avoid altogether even if it can have a healthy form does that answer your question yeah, thanks that, that helps a lot thank mm -hmm. you very much so we have um last two maybe you can take the two questions by kathleen and then followed by martha yeah yeah kathleen please Hi, um, Kathleen. So lovely to hi. see you. Hi. <laughs> um, I hope the household behind me isn't going to be too noisy. Decades ago, when we were talking about emotions, shame fell in the category of the things we called the self-regarding emotions. Mm -hmm. And I think in relation to things you're saying about the worry about the relationship with others, there's also the really key factor about the relationship with the self. Because if we're shamed in that way, we think that some deep truth about ourselves has been revealed. So if the reaction to trauma is anger or even fear, that is less damaging because we're worried that we will be damaged, but we don't feel that we have been shown to be in some way bad, worthless, and so on. But because in the shaming situation, we feel that the trauma has somehow revealed something about ourselves or made us something which is unworthy and horrible. And it's because of our own judgment that that's the case that then leads to the anxiety that others might detect this about us, which leads to the large range of masking behavior that happens and the avoidance behavior to avoid this deep truth of ourselves being made evident to others. And that's what makes it so hard, it seems to me, to engage with, because it's not just you have to deflect the judgment of others there's the judgment of of yourself that some deep truth about yourself you know so this happens a great deal in terms of sexual assault it happens in other situations as well but it's particularly problematic in relation to sexual assault so it's not just sorry that's I, it was more a comment than that and i just found that apparatus that used to hang around about the self-regarding and other regarding emotions. Quite useful there, because the self-regarding emotions are our judgments and responses to ourselves. Okay, finish, thanks. 
Um, thanks for that comment, Kathleen, and for putting it so be beautifully. And I think that that is why shame is so powerful and so hard to like just get over, you know, because it's like deeply about the core self and and a kind of global sense of inadequacy that can endure. It's a lot, a lot to shift a feeling of of deep shame that, that you described. Um, yeah, thank you for that comment. It's helpful. Mm -hmm. Marta, please. Thank you. Thank you, Luna. That was a great presentation. Um, um, my research focuses on access to services by vulnerable groups. And in the past, we conducted interviews with people experiencing homelessness and their access to dental services. And mm -hmm. referring back to what Sean has raised, we found that feelings of shame and embarrassment about the condition of the teeth uh, was actually the main motivator for people to seeking care and wanting to access the services. No, uh, the shame was not necessarily in relation to the clinical encounter because they did report stigma from the healthcare professionals and the society overall. But what, what came uh, from the data is that uh, it was a main motivator for them to wanting to receive care. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, I, I've been working with a dentist in Plymouth. Where are you based, Martha? Plymouth. Yeah, do you know Christina? Yeah, yeah. 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 And um, so she, I mean, you may, you've probably read her piece about shame sensitive practice in dental care. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things we discussed, like shame can motivate. I mean, that's, I think, evidence of how powerful shame can be, that it can motivate you to seek out care, even in a context where you might feel vulnerable and ashamed anyway, right? So there's Absolutely. a the kind of the shame overriding the shame mm -hmm. <laughs> in a way. And then like intense shame of... Um, it's so stigmatized to like be missing teeth and to have bad teeth and it's like it signals all sorts of things like poverty and social deprivation and you know it has all these different connotations so I think that that that's um a really interesting example of how the shame shame dynamics can work in a different way in these contexts mm -hmm. thank you thank you so thank you so much uh we yeah it's exactly we are on time I think we are keeping on yeah, we have 10 minutes break right now, and maybe we can come back at 3.10. I mean, here it's at 3.10, so 10 minutes from now, <laughs> but different time zones. Is that okay, Luna? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm just going to put in, I'm just gonna put in, the, in the chat a link to that blog post I just mentioned about Perfect. from Christina. So Martha's. Yeah. And also feel free if any of you want to share with certain works onto the chat box so that we all can benefit a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we'll just come back again with 10 minutes here. 10 past three, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks.
So we'll wait for a minute more or like, shall we start soon? Mm -hmm. So, uh, Luna, can I start sharing the screen or? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, can you? Yeah, you're close. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now oh, everyone can see the. I'll just uh, introduce you, Sophia. So. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so welcome back, everybody. Hopefully everyone's here. Um, I'm really delighted uh, to introduce Supriya Subramani, who's here today. Um, Sorry, I just need to pull this up. Um, so Supriya is a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Biomedical Ethics and History of Medicine at the University of Zurich, where she works on the philosophical and conceptual constructions of respect and respect for persons within bioethics literature. Her research interests like the intersection of ethics, behavior, and law, and in particular, she focuses on the health interactions, informed consent, and respect for persons. 
Um, she's also interested in qualitative inquiry into moral subjectivities of individuals and moral epistemological inquiries within empirical um, bioethics research. And um, Supriya is presenting a paper um, today um, entitled Exploring Respect and Humiliation in um, Bioethics. And after her presentation, um, I'll give a few comments and then we'll open it up for questions and general discussion. So go ahead, Sophia. Yeah, thank you so much, Luna. Uh, so now uh, all of you can see the, the screen which I'm sharing. There is a PowerPoint there, right? Okay, perfect. So uh, thank you once again, Luna, and, and good evening to you all. I'm really happy that this is all coming together in this workshop series, and I'm also I mean, presenting my working paper, which I've been almost working for since two years. I mean, I have been presenting at different uh, with different groups and getting more feedback. So this is one of my attempts again to work on this paper. So before discussing the paper, I thought I will briefly give you some personal background for why I got interested in this concept, particularly the, the one of the key concepts which I'll be discussing today is on micro inequities and the respect for person and how it is linked to the bioethical principle of respect for person and how I would like to engage with this idea. So I did my doctoral study in India on the concept and practice of informed consent within elective surgery within both medical law and as well as in clinical practice. I did analyze um, you know, medical negligence court cases, especially in Supreme Court judgment and as well as high court um, judgment and consumer courts, like almost around 23 court cases. And also I did an ethnographic study at both private and public hospitals in South Indian city of Chennai. So when we work on informed consent, I mean, of course, right, most of the people who belong to bioethics discipline, you can't escape the mainstream bioethical principles and discussions around it. For example, whether it could be autonomy or decision making capacities around these larger themes, right? So while I was reading these articles and books, um, on one hand, there is a larger thing which you know, something which is in the past that is paternalistic and authoritarian argument, which is something is a past which is done deal, especially within the US and European context. This is the main key works which has been established. That is doctors knows best is something of the past. Whereas there is another new narrative, which is like a new medicine that is patients knows the best. And that gives a more importance for the patient's rights approach. And it has developed within the, uh, especially within the biotech disciplines that respect for autonomy is like quite, very prominent and it is justified in that sense, right? However, when I started doing my field work, especially listening to patient, you know, patients and doctors and family members, and also within the judicial reasoning, I saw that paternalistic attitude argument was the key dominant narrative, which is of, of course no surprise given the embeddedness of hierarchical and patriarchal and also institutional casteism, which is existing in India particularly. And of course, you can see that in many of the other developing countries, right? So the key point which I came to recognize that, wait, how can I talk about autonomy when respecting a patient as person was at stake in everyday encounters, like in everyday life and in everyday public spaces, but also, of course, within the healthcare encounters. So, I mean, for instance, you could see that, right? I mean, uh, a classic example is like even for COVID-19 in India, especially during the beginning of the stages, where the thousands of internal migrants were stranded due to lack of planning. But then I would argue strongly that happened because people are not treated as persons. The state doesn't see its citizens as persons. So this can be seen in every public spaces, as I said, which could be academia, whether it could be in banks or any other bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic institutions, and of course, in medical institution, which is part of the larger society, right? So the underlying assumption that is a patient as a way you see is uh, ignorant and dumb and incompetent, though in many of the biotechs debates, even now it is something which is of a little bit of the past because it's dominated by US and European context, but, it's not the case in many of the developing countries, but then, but it is not just in the developing countries, right? Even in the developed worlds, this is, you can see this tension. However, the degree and the extent to whom it targets, of course, vary. So based on the larger, uh, if you look at the larger healthcare service research and the medical sociology, or even the last presentation by Luna, when we talk about, right, there is a remarkable persistence of 
power asymmetry within the interactions which can happen within healthcare professionals and the patients. So one of the major themes which led me to discuss is uh, which you know, to emphasize is the experiential aspect of respect, which is something which is overlooked. And however, when I used to talk about this, uh, you know, particularly on micro inequities within bioethics circles, particularly who is from the philosophical uh, background, they used to ask me why it matters to bioethics. So that made me think more on this lens and made me write this, you know, the paper which I'm working on. And it's quite an attempt to in order to engage in this discussions. So I'm not sure whether I will convince, but I'll try to do that. So uh, let me just go. This is the outline. What I'm going to do is today. Um, so coming to the paper that like in this paper, I argue that the ethical principle of respect for persons should consider the experiential aspect of disrespect and respect, which is like which I'll call you here is the disrespect angle. To make this argument, I focus on the moral significance of micro inequities, which can lead to experiences such as humiliation. So here, particularly, I'm emphasize on humiliation. In bioethics debates, the notion of humiliation is explained in terms largely within the dignity, of course, not very clearly engaged on, but dignity is the key term there. However, this assumption assumes, like, I mean, it assumes the understanding of humiliation that is much more philosophical and objective in itself, right? So what I will try to attempt is in the first section of this paper, I present the meaning and understanding of micro inequities. In the second and third sections, which I will elaborate further is I'll illustrate um, through the lived experiences and narratives from hospital settings, I present why it is morally problematic or what is the moral wrong of micro inequities. And the last overall, the key argument is in rather than ascribing the discussion of humiliation to normative argument of dignity in an objective sense, I argue for the subjective experience of one self-respect, how you know uh, humiliation affects and influences the self-respect. And I emphasize and bring back the importance of respect for persons in bioethics debates. So to summarize, in, I mean, in a simple way, I will show why respect for persons should consider experiential respect aspect of disrespect particularly by engaging with small and subtle harms as it leads to humiliation and makes one question her, her self-respect. So basically I might be sounding like, please respect. We need to respect each other, a culture of respect. That's what you would be you know, uh, listening to very often. So now uh, understanding the context. So it's important to really show why I'm talking about here, right? So when we talk about respect, it's very easily we tend to say respect for autonomy. It's like respect autonomy, especially in bioethics debate is everywhere. The appeal to respect for autonomy is ubiquitous in bioethics, right? So for instance, debates, whether it's procreation debates or the clinical research participation or organ donations, you name within any of the ethical dilemmas or any ethical issues, we talk about autonomy. So some scholars, especially within the US debates, they, they, they do say that there is a near obsession with autonomy in itself. So in a sense, uh, as widely employed in the field, what does it mean is to respect a person is to respect her autonomy. It is roughly to facilitate or at least not hinder informed and voluntary choices she makes and actions she takes. Here it's a patient mostly or a research subject. So let me briefly highlight some prominent specifications of the notion of respect for persons as respect for the autonomy. Like, for example, where's the shift happen? I mean, uh, Lysart provides a very interesting and uh, very helpful intellectual archaeology of uh, respect in bioethics. So here are the key terms, which I would also refer to as Bellman report, which is like quite a famous and very influential report, which has given um, a push towards bioethics discipline in itself and the debates around it. So this uh, Bellman report strives to identify, um, identify the basic ethical principles that should govern research involving human subjects in particular. And the report highlights three principles, beneficence, justice, and respect for persons. So in the Bellman report, they do talk about respect for persons, but then let's see how they try to understand it, right? So respect for persons, according to the report, incorporates two moral requirements. That is the requirement to acknowledge autonomy the requirement to protect those with diminished autonomy. So here, the autonomous decisions and the choices are given importance. Then people who lack, uh, you know, the autonomous ways of making decisions are given to, I and mean, are supposed to be protected. 
So it is therefore no surprise, right, that according to the report, the principle of respect for persons helps to generate the requirement that especially the research subjects participate in research only if they're given their informed consent. So that's the focus here in particularly. And when I was talking, I mean, when the Bellman Women talks about, you know, to protect from the harm those with diminished autonomy, for example, young children or pregnant women in that sense, or sometimes even the profound mental disabilities, yeah, I mean, adults who have that. So another centerpiece for contemporary US bioethics is, of course, most of you people in who belong to the you know, bioethics disciplines have heard about is principles of uh, you know, uh, bio biomedical ethics, which is like originally published in 1979, which has have a huge influence on the bio, I mean, bioethics debates. And one of the key even approaches principalism in itself. So the principle of autonomy, uh, I mean, principle of respect for autonomy is a norm, according to this, is of respecting and supporting autonomous decisions. So here the key again is the decisions. And the principle of respect for autonomy incorporates both the negative and the positive obligations. So as a negative obligation, they say, uh, Butcham and Childress, it requires that autonomous actions not be subjected to controlling constraints by others. Whereas as a positive obligation, the principle requires both respectful treatment, but here again, the respectful treatment in disclosing information and actions that foster autonomous decision making. So respect for autonomy thus requires, for example, in the medical professionals help patients grasp the understanding what are the, you know, the treatments available options and provide certain informations so that there will be certain outcomes where the patients make uh, decisions according to that. So while we talk about the voluntary and informed consent making autonomous decisions and choices, there is also parallel you know, discussions and debates happening within the biotics and of course within the healthcare debates where a shift from paternalistic approach to the patient-centered approach we can see within the biotics debates. So while scholars who focus on autonomy, while it is very prominent, which basically non-interference and facilitating and making decisions and choices, especially voluntary and informed, um, but there is also other concepts like relational autonomy, like many of the scholars, I mean, again, there's a huge another set of domain and the theories which focus on, it's a relational theories to autonomy explicitly, the social dimension of personal autonomy they talk about. And they give importance for how the social reality, especially the relationship plays a significant role in certain decision making and how we are, you know, people engage in their everyday decision makings too. And there's another interesting approach which has taken a capability approach that's treating patients as persons involves recognizing and cultivating their personal capabilities. So this approach helps us certainly look at autonomy in relational terms, which they do take from the you know, relational autonomy framework, but also they try to emphasize, we need to recognize and cultivate the autonomy capability so that the patient's personal preferences is taken seriously. So, you know, that is again, focusing the capabilities approach, focus on the nuance and situation sensitive way to which they focus. The other scholars emphasize unconditional moral worth and there is many of the physicians or people, uh, healthcare professionals, they emphasize that don't complicate much of the debates, just use, I mean, treat patient as a person that is they have undeniably like moral worth, right? So that's another key point. And then there is a human rights approach. Some of the scholars do talk about uh, using that it's important to emphasize respect should be part of it, but it's more of a human rights argument that it's a dignity. So again, dignity concept is very much very on focus. And also we can see the larger debates within promoting the patient's autonomy is shared decision making uh, within the clinical ethics debates also. So overall, if you look at all these concepts which promotes and talks about autonomy when, whenever they talk about respect for persons. So though the unconditional respect for patients is established in bioethics, the argument debates, what I would say and what I'm trying to observe is, the argument and debates revolve around the concept of autonomy or, you know, which centralizes and talks about rationality, right? Like rationality and agency or decision-making capabilities. It's as if something there is innate certain worthiness qualities of a person, so you know, to respect a person, that is, that's the connection between respect for persons is equal to respect for autonomy. So, one of the things which I'm trying to here look at is, while this is important, we need to talk about autonomy which from a point of decision-making 
capacity? Is it something alone we need to focus on? Can we go beyond this? Especially when we look at the literature on persistent asymmetry, right? Within the healthcare encounters, maybe we need to also look beyond the decision-making capacity. So by focusing on micro inequities, which I'll go, um, which I'll explain it further, is that my claim, I mean, of course, it's not that bioethical debate has been devoid of consideration for respect for the worth of persons, no. It is rather that in several domains, uh, debate would profit from a great deal by giving attention to the you know, experiential aspect of respect, because as I'm gonna say, it affects the person's self-respect and the experiential aspect of disrespect is, I mean, that is especially the emotions like here, which I'm trying to emphasize is humiliation, which is significant and it raises a moral question, moral and ethical question, and particularly you need to talk about respect in that sense. So next, so here, I mean, this is a work which I've been, you know, focusing on since a while. Uh, on micronically since 2018, like uh, during my doctoral study. So I have to, uh, you know, clearly say what is micro inequities here, right? Well, how do I define what does it mean and why it is morally important? So micro inequities are small and subtle harms, not blatant forms of discrimination. They are minute expressions and events that may or may not be recognized by victims and perpetrators. For example, a change in a tone or a voice or a gesture during an interaction. Sometimes even a silence can be sometimes a, you know, a micro inequity. So I borrowed this from Mary Dewey within the organizational behavior where she treats it as an apparently small events which are often ephemeral. So these acts which, the, the interesting thing is these acts which one cannot pinpoint and say it's an outright discrimination, um, and also we can't go to the law or we, can, we can't bring in a lawsuit or fight over, right? I mean, for example, you can't just say, why did you not make an eye contact to me? I mean, you can't keep picking on that, right? So, but there is something, scholars who are working within micro inequities or the larger uh, you know, umbrella term, they, like they all agree on certain basic condition, what makes a certain small act or an uh, action or a behavior as a micro inequity. The first is a minor or subtle acts of behaviors, which may be considered innocuous or small harms. The second may or may not be recognized by both victims or perpetrators and considered mostly as unintentional, which I will differ later, which I'll explain. And the third is, uh, it is considered as a small harms or degradation by dominant groups towards oppressed or marginalized groups. So let me illustrate my position on micro inequity the way I employ it to make my arguments later. So the first, I see while agreeing with the other scholars, micro inequities as subtle and small acts of disrespect, which is both nonverbal and verbal communications, right? As I said, whether it's an icon, contact, uh, empathetic eye contact, lack of that, right? It's also an, a kind of a nonverbal in that sense, or sometimes people say, hey, you people are lazy. And then what does it mean you people with a smile to certain ethnic groups can be considered as, it is an outright discrimination for some group from coming from other point of view, but for the people who are experienced at that moment or that particular situation, it is as small it could be. So, so, so for in, so whether, um, yeah, sorry. So, and also the third person seeing this interaction, as I see, is an, it could be an outright or over discrimination, but who is suffering from that particular social class and category plays a very significant role here. So that is, it, um, it is not that the observers are the third party who has an epistemic authority over which act is over discrimination. Big moral problem or small problem, right? It is the receivers who has that authority. So they may consider that experience as anything, However, receivers of such subtle acts or little acts of disrespect cannot confront or object or sometimes even make them, it makes them question like, did it actually happen, you know? So the second key thing is um, the central argument by most scholars while discussing micro inequities is the distinction from the over discrimination to an unintentional. Those scholars refer to micro inequities and unintentional and would target the perpetrator or unaware about the occurrence. I consider based on my earlier study that is in particular doctoral study, which I did and based on the other works on empirical studies, especially within hospital settings, that the receivers of the micro inequities are often aware of them, but it is normalized. And by normalizing the sense, not like they will accept it, but then they are aware of it. They feel it is, it's, it's a problematic feeling which they have, but 
the perpetrators have taken, and on the other hand, the perpetrators have taken for granted such acts and, and have also normalized it as part of acceptable social practice. So it becomes a part of a habitual, I mean, it's like a moral habit, as which again, in one of my paper, which I talk about. So it gives in to that, you know, the, the whole culture and institutional ethos in itself. So I have discussed, as I said elsewhere, in the, uh, the idea of moral habitus, that is, it is social actors embodied bodily dispositions of everyday practice and cognitive elements which sustain inequality and produces disrespectful attitudes and practices. It could be even the respectful practices, but then it's part of that culture, right? For instance, I mean, I, um, you know, when I was in India, when I mean, when I was doing my field study, a doctor or a nurse yelling at the patient, like screaming, like really yelling at the doctor, I mean, a patient or a family member, especially in the government hospital, you see it very often is accepted and normalized within that context. But for us people, maybe even as a researcher, and I'm saying, how is it possible, right? But it becomes a part of the institutional ethos. So that's the difference there. So the, th uh, the third key point is, while I, uh, I do of course agree with the scholars, I consider micro inequities as repeated and patterned small acts that are often towards often towards marginalized on oppressed groups. And that's- <laughs> Sorry. And um, so whether X in then intended or X uh, or in the sense here, let me just um, go with this. Whether I intended or not, whether I um, caused it or not, but I still have made the other person that is you, if through the certain acts that I made you feel question about your own self-respect and it has maybe has humiliated you, right? So in order to illustrate this, let me just, uh, sorry, yeah. Let me just explain you through the, the two uh, key, um, you know, the, um, the studies which I've been referring for the, uh, to in order to explain this or to illustrate the micro inequities. So the first is I keep following them, the doctors from the ward to their offices and back. They don't even bother to stop for a second and listen to me. They perform surgery again, but did not tell me anything about it. Why or what? As everywhere else, we are made to keep waiting. So the context of this study is uh, back, I mean, this cited in South Indian city of Chennai, which is one of the government hospital uh, caretaker. This excerpt is taken from an ethnographic study which analyzed observational data and in-depth interviews of surgeons, nurses, and patients and family members on their understanding of consent process in two hospitals in the South Indian city of Chennai. A young woman who was from lower social class and caste group was taking care of her mother in a government hospital stated this above statements when I asked her about the clinical interactions and information discussion of the elective surgery. However, not much details was given or informed by doctor to patient not caretaker. When I was a researcher, I met her over three times during this period of hospitalization, saw this young woman state as helpless and she was frustrated with the way she was experiencing her interactions. So the second uh, is, uh, is one of the study by um, uh, Vanya Smith, okay, and she's also here with us. So I re uh, let me read out that. The physician addressed her concerns about her fatigue by joking that she would need to get used to a lack of sleep, telling her. The researcher is, you know, uh, is talking about this. Because you will never sleep when the baby comes, you will get up all the time to check on it. If you're fudangas, I mean, in, uh, the understanding is lazy, you will just ignore it. The patient had thought she was 43 weeks pregnant, but the physician's calculation turned out to be 38.5. Uh, so he turned to her and said, you see how you lie then? So here then with a grin, he asked her, are you easy? She blushed and with a slight stutter that revealed her confusion about the question and answered that she had been with her boyfriend for Two and a half years. Continuing to tease her, he replied, here, here is, he is a doctor. He replied, you see, you're not that easy. You did not get pregnant. Maybe you did not know how. At the end of this exchange, he winked at me, that is here, me is the researcher and the female nurse and intern in the room, the audience of his little joke saying cheekily, I am the worst. So the context is, this excerpt is taken from an ethnographic fieldwork which examined the clinical relationships between obstetric patients and clinicians in a public hospital in the city of uh, Pabela, Mexico. The researcher critiques the efforts for universal health rights as it doesn't address the underlying social and economic inequities and emphasizes how microaggressions contribute to the discriminated local social world. So when we 
closely read these narratives and interactions within the, you know, the social context of each study, we can identify how they target the person's self-respect and disrespect, uh, especially through the subtle acts, right? In the first narrative, a young woman, the caretaker of a mother who underwent surgery in the government hospital states her experience. As I keep following them from ward to their offices back, it shows to the readers, like for us, like with a sense of disrespect is experienced by a victim. It's an experiential way, right? The subtle experiences and the feeling of being ignored are, and needing to please people in power by tailing them, like walking behind in her statements. They don't even bother to stop for a second and listen to me. So, and we are treated everywhere. Again, it shows like how they are treated. That is, it suggests the ways that self-respect is at stake in everyday experiences. So given the evidence of many studies, right, with, within the, I mean, by showing the larger socioeconomic factors and other intersecting characteristics influence the doctor-patient communication. So this narrative suggests how this young woman is ex experiences a humiliation, self-respect and dignity. And it's a, it's a similar thing in the second illustration, right? I provide the interaction between the physician and the young pregnant women who went to the emergency room. So the conversation sheds lights on how physician teases by joking with a patient, framing this young woman with a laziness in caregiving and also sexual proclivities too. So the researcher gives a very insightful um, uh, capturing of how this is subtle microaggressions, which she refers to within the larger, which I would put it in the, you know, the micro inequities. So in both illustrations, the perpetrators fail to acknowledge the experience of the victims and how the routine taken for granted actions and normalized practices, the disrespect, and especially the people who are experiencing that, right? So, you know, so going back to, um, uh, so what does it mean? Like, why is it morally wrong? Because as I said, it's the key stake is, is at the one of, the, I mean, on one hand, it's people too, immediately we can talk about is dignity is questioned. Right. So one of the dominant understanding of normative account of dignity is emphasizing rights, claims and obligations. It is, I mean, for example, the scholar Feinberg puts it to have human dignity is to have rights or to be a potential maker of claims. Then nothing we might do to a human being can rob her of this rights or this potential. So it's something which is quite philosophical, it's something ideal. But there is something, a peculiar tension we can see within the larger dominant uses, that is the idea of dignity as something intrinsic to human being. And, and also there is other thing is secondly, the idea of dignity as something crucial yet fragile, which depends on how people act and how others treat them. So there is a relational aspect to that. So the above difficulties concerning the connection between the notions of humiliation and dignity seem to be avoided if we focus instead on the notion of self-respect. So that's the argument which I'm trying to use with the help of uh, you know, scholars Avishi Maglitz, who says, and then also the statement who talks about that if we connect the subjective experience of self-respect as a way to engage with the idea of um, uh, you know, um, uh, humiliation. Not, we need not go and talk about the dignity as an ideal way, which is the first position which we took. But then if we define humiliation as an injury to self-respect is a way we can emphasize that we need to talk about respect for persons. So, so why it matters to bioethics? That, that's, of course, we can talk in a very different directions, of course, right? We can say we can go in the directions of whether we need to talk in the ethical, theoretical arguments, should we go beyond uh, the consequentialist arguments or deontological arguments or move towards the idea of virtue ethics. I mean, that I'm not going to do in this paper, but what I'm trying to emphasize is, is ethical principles is particularly respect for persons rather than looking at the larger argument, which is quite established right now on a capacity, uh, capacity arguments or rationality or autonomy based arguments. If we focus on experiential aspect of uh, respect that is through the understanding of micro inequities and how micro inequities pushes one person to question their self respect, especially by humiliating experiences, is where uh, there's a huge uh, uh, focus one bioethics uh, has a play, I mean, an ethical principle, which has a key point is respect for persons. And also looking at the larger existing asymmetry within power relationships um, because of the doctor and a patient, right? The understanding from an experiential point of view give a very new insight. 
So it's, it's imagine like a two way door, like the first door is respect, you need to respect a person only then you can even go and talk to a autonomy, I mean, talk, even talk about autonomy. So that's a key uh, point, which I would like to end with, I think I'm running out of my time. So and of course, I draw the, uh, the understanding of respect for persons from the Stephen Dowell's argument of recognition respect, which I will be discussing later when we have time. Um, yes, so I think I'm good to go now and I'll be, I'm looking forward to have a um, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Sufriya. Thank you very much for that. Um, so before we open it up for questions, um, it falls to me to make just some comments. And I, I really enjoyed the paper and I think um, I've read it before and, or I think I've read a slightly longer version that you sent me. So some of my comments might um, be about aspects of the paper that you didn't articulate fully in this talk. But I think your work in general and this paper in particular touch on something really important that if we wanna improve clinical encounters um, and how they're experienced and concomitantly how um, health and health outcomes are, um, uh, can be improved, then we really need to attend to and understand the kind of textures of lived experience um, within those contexts and within those encounters and how feelings, emotions and affects and other experiences um, sort of circulate in different dynamics within those encounters. And of course, how that's bound up to power relations and institutional structures and interpersonal dynamics, as you point out, among other things. Um, so there are some, some things that stood out to me when I was reading the paper and listening again today. Um, so there are a few things around concepts that I thought in terms of, especially coming from um, a phenomenology and thinking about emotions and like fine grained distinctions between different types of experiences. Um, I found that there were some concepts that were kind of muddy or conflated maybe. So um, social disrespect in um, the paper I read, you say is, is to be seen as humiliation, but it was never clear how humiliation is conceptualized. And I think that's something we've talked about before, like what, what is meant by humiliation and how is this different from shame or other negative self-conscious emotions? Um, and I feel like there must be an instances of social respect that might lead to a milder negative self-conscious experience. Like humiliation, as it's commonly understood, is like this like intense feeling of being degraded or put down by another. But um, a micro inequity or microaggression or some other sort of small slight might lead to something much milder, I suppose. Like, is it is it really humiliation or? If it is, how are you using that term and how does humiliation, is it the same as social disrespect um, or is it something else? So yeah, I thought that was, that remained a little bit unclear to me. Um, and also I was wondering if lack of respect is the same thing as questioning one's self-worth. So if you have an experience of a lack of respect or you experience disrespect, does that necessarily entail that you might then start to question your self-worth. And I think one of the like critical phenomenologists that I've been engaging with is this Latina feminist phenomenologist called Mariana Ortega. And she talks about world traveling. It's a kind of concept in Latina feminist phenomenology where in a US context, um, people who might come from Latin backgrounds move between worlds. They move between the white dominant world um, and then their kind of the, the Latin world, let's say. And she writes about this experience of coming from Nicar Nicaragua when she was a child, but being a US um, you know, philosophy professor in a, in a white world and how her experience of moving between worlds means that, like what the dominant norms that are framing her experience in a particular situation might be different depending on what world she's in. And so a slight in her own world might be experienced really differently from a slight or an aggression or something in, in the white world. And I think that there's something like really deeply contextual about how these things land and how they're experienced, depending on which world you're inhabiting or which normative framework that you're, you're kind of um, inhabiting or experiencing at a particular point. Um, I thought the examples you drew from were really great and really illustrative, but it felt like they were both from um, contexts, and you say this yourself, where there are much more rigid social hierarchies and like the the behaviors that are normalized in a healthcare context might seem like quite extreme to us in a UK context, like doctors shouting at patients just would not be okay. But, um, and then you use this, this language of, um, 
I think you use the term subtle quite a lot in the paper I read to describe like these subtle power dynamics or, or subtle power symmetries or subtle ways of interaction. But it was kind of like the word subtle felt to me completely at odds with what you were describing because yeah, yeah, yeah. it was like really not subtle from our, from an Anglo-European context, I suppose. Yeah. Where they, it felt quite overt and blatant that that, that, that a behavior is not appropriate. Um, but maybe in, in a different cultural context, it's much less obvious or overt. Um, so that was something that struck me when I was re reading it, like the way you were describe discussing those examples was kind of at odds with how extreme they came across yeah. as. Yeah. Um, and I think the question of autonomy that you raised in the introduction is really important. I'm not like, to be honest, I'm not a bioethicist and not overly familiar with how it's the principle of autonomy is discussed in bioethics, but I know I have had this like ongoing conversation with one of my collaborators, Barry Lyon, who is an, a bioethicist and, and, a, and a doctor, he's a, an anesthetist, about how in that literature there isn't much discussion about how emotions might um, complicate or interfere with um, or compromise autonomy. Um, and, and that's for us, that's particularly interesting in the context of shame because shame is such an, a powerful driver of behavior and is avoided um, at all costs, at, well, not always avoided at all costs, but often avoided at all costs that it can challenge reason and rationality. So people might do things to avoid shame that is against their better interests. And so if shame is in the picture, is, is there, you know, is there capacity to make an autonomous decision? And, um, and Barry has sort of mentioned to me how that, 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 that's surprisingly like kind of absent in the bioethics literature. So that's something that struck me if there's something worth discussing more fully in relation to your ideas around disrespect and humiliation. Not that they're, that, that can dis considerations are missing from autonomy, but like how themselves, those experiences themselves might impact or interfere with autonomy. So there's like a kind of another layer of why this might be relevant to that, that yeah. area of bioethics. Um, just two more things. Um, so one of the things that really struck me as well is there's a lot in there, um, about how micro inequities become an embodied social practice and how you discuss um, moral habitus, the moral habitus that has like really strong overlaps with some literature and critical phenomenology. Some thinkers like George Yancey and Helen No, who write through a, a kind of phenomenological lens, maybe in the tradition of Merle Ponty, um, about how racism is actually an embodied habitual practice. So it's through the kind of gestures and micro gestures and movements and behaviors of the body that that racism is communicated. And I think that really maps on well to the discussion you have about the micro inequities. I can point you to some of that literature, but it just seemed really parallel the way you were conceiving it. Mm. And then the last point is just how does all of this affect health and health outcomes? So we're talking about clinical settings and clinical encounters. And um, I think it's a really powerful kind of underpinning of why this is important is, that if if these things are these experiences are interfering with health and health outcomes, yeah. then they should you know there's a kind of imperative to address them. Um, it's not just that people have nicer experiences, but actually this will actually improve yeah. health care um, yeah. in a broader sense. And so how, and I thought that, that kind of feeds into some of the thinking that Barry and I've done around shame as an affective determinant of health. It's not that just experiencing shame in a clinical encounter might make you feel bad, but actually that can directly have relevance to health, yeah. to your health and, um, and your health outcomes. It, it leads to poorer health outcomes, essentially. So I think thinking about it through that lens could strengthen the kind of arguments for why this is super important to consider. That's yeah. my last comment, so thank you. Thank and you. yeah, please respond yeah. and we can open it up. So, so on the first point, like which you talked about is social disrespect. I mean, um, so when I was reading this book by Avishi Magas on the decent society, where the emphasis is on the humiliation, which is like something as an injury to self-respect. And as you uh, did mention about the parallel terms, like even with the other emotions, right? Like shame and um, uh, the experiences, which can also sometimes may end up making you question self-respect too. So how do I differentiate humiliation as a difference between shame? Let's if I'm even trying to think, shame is something which, I mean, now I'm thinking about is something which you as a person, when you're experiencing it, you question it, like maybe you also can be internalizing it. Whereas a humiliation, I feel there is a rejection. No, I don't deserve this. There is 
I, I, I wore them more and I'm feeling humiliated. I think that's what I, I would try to see that that's the difference. And maybe I should as you said, I will. Exp I, I need to clearly define how I am understanding humiliation. I, I think I will do that. I think I've not done that uh, good enough in the paper. And um, and lack of self respect. I mean, that was your second point, right? I mean, talking about um, uh, like, did I get your question right? That you know, to understand self respect, is it something which is the person feels it or someone's some the other person makes you feel to question your self-respect is, is did i get it wrong right sorry i'm muted um is lack of self-respect lack of respect the same as questioning one's moral worth and i only i raised it because um you in the paper i read there was a kind of passage where those things were sort of put together as um but of course now I can't find the page it was on. So you just keep talking. <laughs> no. So what I understand is, so when I, whether lack of self-respect or when a person questions self-respect, is it equal to questioning their moral worth? I would say need not be, mm -hmm. but then especially from the humiliation point of view, when I focus on, I feel that a person, when they're questioning their self-respect, they're trying to say like for example like the tailing experience which i narrated right mm -hmm. the women like i remember she was talking having this informal discussion so why are we treated like this i'm not supposed to be treated like this so there's a pushback and they, she but she also feels humiliated because of her body language changing and it makes it like a experience like i don't want to do this but i have to do this and i don't deserve this experience and so she doesn't question her own dignity but then there is other spaces which she you know, as you said, like she moves around like different uh, like public spaces, whether it's uh, other school settings or the workplace, she's constantly treated because maybe because of her uh, class and of course the person whom I interact was from a lower class and, you know, caste background. And mm -hmm. she, you know, uh, was trying to say, we don't, we are, have, uh, we need to be treated like better people. That is respect me as a person, not from because I am from this particular background. You know, so I wouldn't immediately say they're questioning this moral worth, but then pushing back that moral worth. I feel like I deserve more. You need to treat me better. But because of the injustice already in this context and there is a power hierarchy, I am not treated this which I'm supposed to be treated. You know, that's a push back and forth. I would see it as mm -hmm. not immediately like I they wouldn't internalize it. I feel that that's the thing, even though they may normalize it, but may not be internalizing it. And um, the third point, which you said is, I, I mean, I've heard this from many of the scholars. I mean, when I presented my paper, like, especially within the Western, when I presented in Europe, they said, this is not the subtle things. This is like outright discrimination. This is outright. So that, that's, a, um, that's a key thing, which I feel the third, uh, you know, criteria for micro inequities. So it moves within that context, that social context that plays a very significant role. And as I said, uh, one of the example, like uh, in the government hospital in Indian setup, right? I mean, when a, when a nurse is shouting at a patient or a family member, even though there is a tension there, but it is seen as something, it's okay and acceptable. Everyone knows this is how it is done. And sometimes they'll even laugh and smile about it. And they, they'll be nice and talking later, you know, even though they may be shouting, there'll be a lot of tension around it, but then something very accepted and habitual. That's the thing which I go back to that moral habit as it, it becomes part of that. So now who has a right to say this experience is something a subtle or which uh, experience is some, or an act is not subtle is a, another uh, epistemic way of looking at the small and subtle harm in itself, right? I mean, uh, does it have a big impact or it's a, it doesn't have an impact at all? I mean, the consequences also one can be having a discussion around it. So in this paper, what I would see it as the social context plays a significant role. At the same time, how a person who is at the receiving end experiences it plays a very important role. And as if it makes one person humiliate, the humiliating experience is so strong that they end up questioning their understanding of I need to push back, why I don't deserve this kind of an experience. I feel then we need to talk about respecting that person. So that's the ethical uh, you know, value which I'm pushing for. Okay, we need to respect them. We need to bring the argument of respect for person there. And the fourth point which you talked about is emotions. I mean, that's really a key point in bioethics. So in the, uh, in the in, in, I mean, 
in the present biotics debates, um, emotion discussions, they do talk about, but not much, not much have been, as you pointed out, not much discussion has been done, uh, especially the how emotions plays a role within the normative arguments. That has not been done much, but they do focus about in a clinical ethics dilemmas, like how emotions plays a very significant role when making life end of life decisions, for example, how emotions um, makes a person change the decision sometimes, especially in a relational terms. They do talk about it, but maybe as you said, I need to look and draw upon much discussion where the, uh, the, the juncture which we can bring in much more uh, focus towards emotions and key role which plays in ethical arguments. I, I mean, I, I see it as a very key important point. And uh, thank you for pointing out to the, um, you know, the parallel understanding of phenomenology and how we can bring into the aspects of, um, you know, as you pointed out, the embodied way of uh, being and experiencing this. I think I will work on uh, looking at how I can bring in the parallel understanding with that. And um, the sixth point, which you finally said is, of course, health outcomes, right? Yes, it's not just about making everyone feel good, but also by making this experience, like you need to feel treat treating respectfully and the culture of respect within the medical institution, if it increases, if it has becomes much more inclusive, the access to healthcare, is, it becomes much easier for people who are from marginalized oppressed. That means better health outcomes. That means better ways of, uh, you know, uh, improvements within, for example, uh, taking tablets more or like uh, adhering the, you know, the treatments. And of course it becomes overall, a, a patient-centered care becomes much more easier and accessible. So, yeah, thank you. So that, I mean, to re-emphasize it is, of course, I agree that it's not just uh, stops at the feel-good factor, but also it's much more beyond that too, yeah. And I think- Great. And I think um, we'll open up for questions. So Joseph has put a queue in the chat. So if you have a question, Joseph. And if anyone Hi. wants to raise hand. Hi, Joseph. Uh, hi, Sabrina. Hi, Joseph. It's nice to see you after a long Nice to see time. you too. Thanks ever so much for the talk, which was really, uh, really interesting, really rich. Um, I just have a, a very general question about your understanding of um, respect as it's used in different um, uh, bioethical contexts. Mm -hmm. So you started with respect as it's often used in bioethics and the focus on competent individuals and respect, meaning that you should respect their autonomy. Um, and then you, you know, proceed to the where you label micro inequities and the ways in which they evince the failures of respect. Now, it seems in both cases, at both ends, um, we have a failure of recognition respect, right? There's a particular value that these people have in virtue of uh, being persons. They're not accorded that value. They're treated in ways that are inconsistent with it. Mm -hmm. So is it right to understand your view as there's a um, continuum of, of ways in which you can fail to give someone appropriate recognition respect. And so at one extreme, we might have a rights violation where you treat someone in a way that is not appropriate given that they're a person. At the other end, you have maybe the slightest of uh, microaggressions. And this is all on a continuum? Or is it the case that you have different um, concepts and we should be dividing up the logical space in a particular way. So the micro inequity is a different type of thing than the failure to respect someone's rights. No, um, so what I would uh, say it as, it's a continuum, but okay. at the same time, so I would focus within the recognition aspects, as uh, I did mention, like I draw upon a lot of my arguments from Stephen Darwell's argument of recognition respect. Mm -hmm. But the departure, like, and I wouldn't say departure, the little bit of shift in a focus, which I would try to emphasize is the experiential aspect, which has been almost missing within the bioethics debates. Like very few feminist scholars do talk about the experiential aspect from a vulnerability point of view, right? In a bioethics scholar, in the debates. But then the focus again is in the decision-making, especially on preferences, like what the patients prefers to make, you know, the preferences or the choices. So the engagement of choices, decision-making, and especially within the capacity arguments, which as I was mentioning, capability or capacity arguments, it stops right there, or it goes to the other layer with saying patients by default, that is any persons have moral worth, and it stops there. 
But then I'm saying, you know, to make it put into practice, that is, you need to talk about acts and attitudes and behaviors too. But then the next question is, can we go and micromanage? Like what kind of an actions should we talk about as respectful or what kind of an actions are disrespectful? So, but then what I'm, I would be a bit hesitant or scared is, of course, it's not about micromanagement, but it's about to, trying to understand at that particular, it's a nuanced thing. It's a relational always, right? When you go to the two interactions within two people, it's always relational. And then the respect for persons should be also understood within that, you know, understanding of experiential ways of engagement. So that's the focus which I'm trying to shift from. Acknowledging that while decision-making arguments, capacity and autonomous decisions are important, but also focus more on experiential ways of dealing and engaging with people. Like, you know, to have a respectful engagement, what kind of an importance we need to talk about? That's the shift which I'm trying to draw on. And yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think I would be tempted there to say that the way that you should treat someone or something in terms of respect is one thing, mm -hmm. and the effects of failing to do so mm -hmm. are another. Right. So you could say both um, this doctor's behavior was disrespectful, mm -hmm. but also this had a negative effect on the person's well, welfare, right? Because you yeah. can be disrespected, but, but ignore it or not notice it or whatever, right? Yeah. The person selected wrongly, but you are fine. Yeah. And it sounds like you have two things going on here. Yeah. One is yeah. we need to get these more nuanced cases of disrespect, but the other is we also need to pay attention to the welfare implications exactly. of yeah. disrespect. Yeah, I would put it in that right. Yes, that's true. Thank you. To Thank you. Put it out there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Joseph. Um, any other questions or comments? Um, Paul? Hi, thanks very much. A fantastic paper. And I'm really interested in, in what you had to say and, and, and actually in Luna's response really about the sort of autonomy and the capacity of the individual. And I'm just wondering that if the patient in the clinic uh, and the gaze of the clinician to the patient is not to ask what matters to the patient most mm. or gives epistemic justice to them. And if the, if the clinician is, is focused on longevity or the thought that death is the failure if they don't treat, then it could, of course, be that the, the clinician who encourages, I don't know why that's the word to use, but it, it enables that sense of shame to come to the patient. And if the view is that you treat because that's what you must do to keep life going, and that isn't what the patient wants, there's a gap. And in that liminal space, the patient might be shamed and say, I want to disengage. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering what, what happens, because I think a lot, of the, a lot of the discourse in both of the really brilliant papers was almost that it's the patient who experiences the shame. Mm -hmm. What happens when the clinician also feels shamed because he or she is unable to treat? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's this kind of this rather circular idea that, that everybody's in the liminal space, everybody's peering at shame and said, it's not mine. And it kind of gets, it's, it's like something that's left on the carpet and nobody wants to pick it up, but everybody's experiencing it. So there's something quite interesting in that. I don't know whether you want to speak to any of that. Hmm. So quickly to respond to that. I mean, I think um, I agree totally because on many times, people, I mean, physicians, especially from uh, within India, from a non, not from the dominant caste, when they engage with certain other lower caste identities, the similar community, they try to understand the understanding of how should I talk to them? Should I be so careful or should I also, because I'm also at the receiving end of the similar thing. Many of the patients may also shout it or like making you feel like ashamed of your identity too, right? Or shamed or humiliated for different things. So then the question is, of course, when we talk about healthcare and biotech debates, it's the much of emphasis on vulnerable groups and vulnerable things, um, vulnerable people here, ex exactly patients. So that's, again, we've shifted the, the importance to the patients here, I see, like with my own work. But then coming from the physician's point of view, that's a huge research in itself, huge, you know, engagement. But the the key point is, of course, we need in both interactions, the two parties need to understand that that space belongs to each other, but at the same time, we need to respect each other. So what does it mean there? When there is certain misunderstanding, I mean, that's much of a debate, right? We can, uh, we, we need both perspectives, but then finally, who, 
who's key uh, issues at stake, uh, for example, whether it's a humiliation, whether it's at the shaming or whether it's a certain stigma aspects. So it could be in any of the aspects, but then whose stake is at higher end here? Who is at the losing hand much more? I mean, maybe I would put it from that point of view, but I'm not sure whether I addressed your question because I know it's a lot of uh, engagement which we can continue in this. But Luna, if you want to respond, yeah. Yeah, and I guess that's one of the things, I mean, shame is, an, is a relational emotion and it, it's contagious and it, it circulates and it's always in a kind of dynamic. And I think that's one thing that comes up anecdotally in, in terms of healthcare is that like shame can be discharged onto um, patients if a clinician is feeling insecure or unsure or unshamed that can then lead to defensive or aggressive or some sort of behavior that might not be the most helpful in the circumstances. And I guess part of um, shame sensitive practices we're kind of thinking about it in healthcare is that like, as a practitioner, you take, you are aware of shame dynamics, you have a handle on your own experiences and that you take responsibility for them and kind of manage the manage those dynamics in, in a clinical space because you're the, you know, you're the practitioner. But, um, but that's not obvious. And like often these things are um, un, un, subterranean, right? Like they're happening pre-consciously or unreflectively, but like that's part of the idea of, of shame sensitivity. It involves some shame competence <laughs> so um, and some emotional intelligence. And if that was like built into how people are trained, that would lead to really different experiences, I think. Mm. Yeah, and uh, to quickly respond to Kat, uh, like she asked, can frequent and cumulative micro experience of dyspraxia add up to humiliation? Certainly, I would say. Um, it certainly does. Um, but should we focus on always on accumulation and not about the particular individual uh, event? I would say it plays a very important role to focus on cumulative, that is institutional solutions, institutional ways of engaging with these issues, that is disrespect is important, but also at the individual interaction level it also plays a very significant role. For example, one of the disrespectful even could, would not be the same for a male from a privileged class compared to a person, from, a woman who is from a different, uh, you know, lower caste group or lower class groups. The experiences would be very, uh, the degree varies a lot and we need to give importance even to that, I would say. And um, yeah, is there any other questions? Uh, any other questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Is there anything else, Supriya, you'd like to? Um, one of the key questions, which I'm not sure whether, I mean, I, I would be happy if anyone of you could give me feedback on this is when I was discussing about within the bioethics domain, like, are you using this micro increase way of engagement to respect for persons and move towards a virtue ethics? So do anyone have a key input for me on this lens? Like, because I'm trying to talk about, we need to be respectful. We need to be a very good human being, so-called, and then we need to respect everyone, right? Then some of the arguments which they said, are you suggesting it's important to shift towards virtues? But I would say not always, not be, because I also focus on the certain, I mean, the, the rights and of course on the duties. So still within the Kantian framework, I work along with, but then what would you have to say? Any of you have to talk about the virtue ethics point of view. I'm, I'm keen on learning that. I'll just say that's outside of my expertise. <laughs> I can't <laughs> offer any comments. I'm not sure if anyone else has any expertise. Joseph, do you have anything to give inputs on this? On the question of whether to move into virtue ethics? I mean, does, do you think the experiential aspect of disrespect, would it belong to our like certain ways of building into becoming a better person? I mean, is there a certain point of view where we can take from? Would you see that? I mean, I feel like you have the, um, the conceptual materials you need already without going into virtue ethics. It's not that, it, that you couldn't do it in those terms. Obviously, I think you could, but I don't think you need to. Um, I was also struck when you were talking about not micromanaging mm. uh, by the way that I think actually a lot of um, 
the ways in which patients and research participants have begun to be respected more has been a result of micromanaging. Mm-hmm. Um, like teaching people how to treat patients, how to address them, um, teaching people how to get informed consent in a way mm-hmm. that people, you know, that the patient feels like they're empowered to ask questions, that they're empowered to say no. Like and there's been a sort of ongoing, at least in, you know, hospitals and research centers that care about this there's been an ongoing attempt to educate and improve Mm -hmm. um, what people do which isn't just inculcating virtues it's saying this is how you show respect Mm -hmm. right and giving really specific behaviors for the ways in which you do it so in a way i'd be tempted to say don't foreground the virtues foreground um uh descriptions of the behaviors that constitute respect Mm -hmm. In yeah. the same way that at the moment you have, you know, right. beautiful descriptions of the behaviors that constitute disrespect. Right, right, right. Yeah, but uh, I mean, when as you were explaining me this now, like I was like struck with like patients are given certain ways, as you said, micromanage to, you know, facilitate them to exercise it, you know, ways of mm-hmm. doing certain actions. Whereas if we do the similar ways towards the physicians, like you need to behave in this is this is this is way. I would see it as like, yeah, quite problematic because then it is like putting without the feelings into that, I feel like without really understanding that uh, relational point of view. Yeah. So as you said, yeah, I don't have to do that or I don't need to do that. And they go together, right? When you, if you're, um, uh, for example, if, if a physician, I'm thinking in the US context here, so sorry about that. But that's the context I'm most familiar with. Um, but if someone is, um, engaged in cultural competency training, right? And it's done well. They're both being given an understanding of um, culture of cultural differences, um, an understanding of what matters, right? In terms of, um, of respect and human relationships, but also specific behaviors that they should consider. Mm-hmm. Um, what would constitute treating someone with respect? Mm. Uh, in this context yeah, yeah. so I think the whole the whole thing goes together and, and it can be helpful to be really explicit um, and I think doctors uh, definitely respond to you know here's the list of behaviors you should be paying attention to right? <laughs> rather than you'll know it when you see it just try yeah. to be a you know a respectful person <laughs> yeah. just just one more thing like the um, in sort of earlier points in the 20th century, you know, where the paternalist attitude of physicians was generally accepted, it wasn't that physicians thought they were disrespecting people, Mm-mm. right? It wasn't that if you said to them, you know, is this a person? They would be like, no, it's not a person. I don't need, right? But it was the understanding that developed of what respect actually mm-hmm. consisted in that was important. At least that was how I would read the, right, um, right. the changes. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah, thank you. I mean, on the larger level, like, I mean, recently I was trying to understand, okay, whether to talk about like bell hooks arguments, which I started reading recently. And then, wait, you can never have a respect if you don't have a culture of love because you need to have a respect. You need to see two people as equal. But of course, in the medic- medical institutions, how can you see a doctor and a patient as an equal? As two people, yes. Two equal human beings, yes. But the, within the existing power asymmetry and within existing medical institutions, which is so huge. Um, so then do we need another kind of an understanding that the culture of respect, which also means underlying the larger love as a way of characteristics, you know, like which the society, which we need to as, you know, keep talking about is something which I recently I've been, you know, thinking or pondering over that idea too, but yeah. But thank you. Yes, that's true. It's like on one hand, there's a lot of cultural competency training programs. On the other hand, you to talk about stereotyping acts and what kind of a behaviors we need to focus on and not. But then you can clearly say these and this are the acts which you need, need to do, but then trying to understand from what kind of a disrespectful attitudes, behaviors you don't have or you shouldn't gives us some guidance to walk through and navigate these encounters. Yeah. Thank you, Joseph. Great, so if, are there any other questions? If not, we can finish early. So yeah. 
No. So maybe not. Do you want to mention the next um, seminar, Supriya? Let me just see. The next seminar is on October 22nd, right? Uh, we have from Vani Smith. And let me just open the website. Sorry. Uh, and we have another five series, which it would be great if you guys could all like look into this and be able to, you know, oh, sorry, I'll let me just send it to everyone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The next series. And uh, the, it's on 22nd October by Vanya Smith Oka from University of Notre Dame, Microaggressions as Forms of Humiliation and Shame Within Medical Encounters in Mexico. And by easier presentation from Sarah Howard on accounting fake letterings, shit, shame, and the state. So that's quite fascinating, which I'm really looking forward to, you know, continuing the discussion around the shame and, you know, within the larger public health. Yeah. Great, thanks. So thanks everyone for coming and hopefully see you again at a future um, event. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luna. And thank you all. Thank you to, for everyone for being here patiently and for your questions. See you all. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.